Escape with us on a legendary journey along Ireland's longest river. Through an emerald green landscape of rolling hills and sparkling waters. The river to me is my life. Let your troubles flow away with the water. Discover how Vikings, monks and medieval kings have left their mark on this important waterway. Ireland's greatest high king, Brian Boru. From here, he could basically rule the river. We'll meet and travel with the modern day adventurers who live and work along this river. Even in the absolute, you could say misery out here, it's kind of exhilarating. All the way to the dramatic cliffs where this mighty river meets the wild Atlantic Ocean. This is one of the most scenic river journeys in the world. Ireland's River Shannon. This mountain range in the north of Ireland 177 kilometers northwest of Dublin is where our journey begins. The rain that falls here will become the waters of Ireland's longest and most important river. Carving through the country from north to south, the Shannon has been a crucial route connecting the center of Ireland with the rest of the world for thousands of years. And the first glimpse you get of it is right here at the Shannon Pot. One person who knows this impressive landscape above and below ground is geologist Martina O'Neill. As nature reserve manager, it's her dedication that keeps this special park open to visitors all year round. So we're standing here now at what's known as the Shannon Pot this dark pool of water, which looks relatively innocuous, when it in fact is exactly the opposite. This body of water is the rising of the mighty River Shannon. This is the first occasion where you'll actually see this river on the surface as it begins its journey to form the fantastic river that it then becomes. Up until now, the water has traveled underground until pretty much this exact point. The reason being, if we were to see below the ground and beneath our feet, the rock type tier actually changes from limestone to a mixture of sandstones and siltstones. Now these are much harder rocks and in that way, they actually force the water upwards onto the surface as opposed to traveling underneath. She may be a scientist by training, but as a local, Martina has a passion for the myths and stories that surround the River Shannon. Areas of significance like here at the Shannon Pot are steeped in mythology, in history and in legend. And typically those are not that far removed from the actual reality, the scientific reality behind the situation. Here we have some hazel trees. You normally associate hazel with the lovely alkaline limestone soils. Legend has it that there were actually nine hazel trees that surrounded the Shannon Pot. The tale goes that hazelnuts fell from these trees and fed a salmon who became wise. Shannon, the granddaughter of the Celtic god of the sea, Lear, came here in search of wisdom. But when she arrived, the wise salmon was angry and made the waters rise, drowning the girl and her body flowed all the way down to the sea, forming the river that we now call the Shannon. It is a fascinating place. It is a place of intrigue. And I think in that respect, a very fitting start for the Shannon, which weaves and meanders its way through the fabulous landscape here. From the Shannon Pot, the river takes us to its first lake, Loch Allen. Then to Carrick-on-Shannon, the cruising capital of Ireland. We head past Lanesborough to Loch Ree and Athlone. Through Banagher, 
and on to the mystical islands of Loch Derg. We'll discover historic Killaloo and the immense Ardner Crusher power station before the Shannon carries us through the estuary to Loop Head, where it meets the Atlantic. For the first leg of our 370 kilometer journey, we can't simply jump in a boat. We have to wait for this small stream to become a navigable river. Trickling south from the Shannon Pot down through the Iron Mountains, the Shannon becomes a river when it passes under this bridge. It marks the first settlement on its course, the village of Dowra. Then, eight kilometers downstream, it flows into its first lake. Loch Allen is 14 kilometers long and five kilometers wide, but rocky and shallow in places. Not a great lake for boating, but one perfect for exploring by paddleboard. We're joining these experienced boarders from the local town of Drumshanbo. They favor this sheltered stretch leading south from Loch Allen, known locally as the Drum Shamazon. Do you ever look at the reflection? But look at it so hard you don't see the water. It looks like it belongs in the Amazon. Yeah, the Drum Shamazon. After a 16-kilometer paddle downstream, we reach the town of Carrick-on-Shannon. A lively county town. It's the biggest in the area. It's a key stop-off point for visitors to Ireland's heartlands who want to sample life on the river. Carrick-on-Shannon has become known as the cruising capital of Ireland. Our transport for the next leg of our journey is the Moon River. Built from scratch 25 years ago here in town, she's equipped with a 210 horsepower engine and has a cool cruising speed of nine knots an hour. For the next 47 kilometers, we're in the safe hands of skipper Michael Brehany, who's been sailing up and down the Shannon since he was 17. I describe the Shannon as a series of lakes joined together by a river. I think you can get lost on this river, get out of the way of everyone, and just have your own time peaceful. I've spent all my working career on the water. The appeal for me was it was a different way of life uh, because most people of my age went into construction and buildings and all that sort of work. But boating was a new way of tourism here in the 60s, and a new way of life, especially for a guy like me. It was so different. I love the scenery. It's the luscious green and all the different shades of green that we have here on the river. For me, it is a terrific place to be, I think. And that's just, uh, that's just me. We're traveling the length of the Shannon climbing aboard different boats as we journey from source to sea to discover how ancient civilizations have made their mark on this vital waterway. Stretching for 29 kilometers north to south, the second lake on the Shannon's course is Loch Ree. 
surrounded by reed beds, it's an important winter stop-off for wildfowl, making their annual migration. Sitting at the north entrance to Loch Ree is the town of Lanesborough, home to 1,500 people who have taken on an unusual town mascot. And he's out for a spin on the lake today. Legend has it that a fearsome sea serpent lives in the depths of Loch Ree. It's a monstrous tale that goes back to the earliest records. The legends predate 600 AD. The first account of a hunting party chasing a deer, and the deer went into the lake and swam across to one of the islands. But nobody in the hunting party was willing to follow for fear of the monster or the creature in the lake devouring them. Local artist Stephanie Hanlon decided the Loch Ree monster story needed updating. So this five metre homage to upcycling is now the centrepiece for the annual Loch Ree Monster Festival. And the festival itself was just a great idea to bring the community together. A bit of crack, a bit of fun, and to bring a spotlight to the village here. <laughs> well, tell us what it's like. It's up out of the legs. <laughs> <laughs> The locals here may be unafraid of their less than fearsome mascot, but with water as deep as 36 meters in places, there are real risks to exploring this lake, as search and rescue volunteer Fergal knows only too well. We have a very active local community, a lot of clubs. I'm a member of Lockery Sub Aqua Club, search and recovery unit. So we'd be called out to help people who've had incidents in boats. You know, fishermen have gone missing in storms and we'd have to go down the lake at speed, maybe in the dark. Um, we've often been searching in uh, zero visibility conditions. Sometimes when I'm down there in the depths, you'd sometimes wonder about the Loch Ree monster. Am I going to get my, my face chewed off, you know, for my trouble? The legend of the beast of Loch Ree endures. As we continue our journey southwards, there's another mystery to uncover an abandoned settlement dating back to the 13th century. On this headland, jutting out into the Shannon, there was once a busy medieval town. The bustling trading post of Rin Doon grew up around a Norman castle built in 1227. Historian Dr. Regina Donlan has been walking these ruins for decades to discover more about the people who once called this place home. So where we're standing right now, we're completely surrounded by water on two sides and a defensive wall across the land boundary on the peninsula. This was really, really significant for defending the province of Connacht from the water side. A key vantage point with views up and down the river, this castle was well protected against attacks from the water. The problem with the peninsula was that it was bounded on one side by a town wall, and this was definitely the weak link. On four occasions between 1229 and 1274, the famous Gaelic tribe, the O'Connors, they managed to breach the wall and attack the castle. I think that's an interesting thing. This one piece will make 52 layers. Watch on mobile devices or the big screen. All for free, no subscription required. This structure right here is the former gatehouse. Now this was the essentially the main entrance into the town. So you would ride up, up here on your horse, have a chat with the guard, tell him what your business was in the town, and then he would decide whether or not to give you entry. This was the main land boundary that defended the town. So there were three defensive towers all the way along the wall. Like when you think about the engineering of it for the 13th century, it's, it's really quite phenomenal. Rindoon's strategic position on the River Shannon meant it prospered as the main trading post for the area, home to merchants, a military encampment, and a boat building workshop. So one of the key buildings on the site is the old church. 
We're not exactly sure of when the church itself was established, probably sometime just before the castle. Um, but what we do know is that it was still in existence in the middle of the 14th century. The church itself could accommodate about 800 people, so experts suggest that the population of the town at its peak was somewhere between 8 and 1,200 people. So this was quite a prosperous, busy little place back in the 14th century. So as we're walking across, you can actually see where all the walls exist today. And what a lot of the historical experts have suggested is that the fields as we see them today are where the civilian settlements were when the town was at its height, and the stone walls are roughly plotted along where the streets existed when the town was at its height. And as I'm walking across here, I can really kind of get a sense of the area, looking at different ridges in the land, wondering what type of buildings were there. And I can almost hear the chatter of the people as they went about their daily business. The importance of the castle site of the Rendun desert medieval town is really uh, something unique to the area and something that everyone in Le Caro feels very passionate about. We're voyaging down Ireland's River Shannon. From its source all the way to its wide estuary which leads to the crashing waves of the Atlantic Ocean. From Loch Ree, we're following the river south, through Athlone, the largest town in the region. We'll stop off for a drink in Banaha, then head into the third and final lake the Shannon flows into, Loch Derg. For the next leg of our journey, we're crossing the lake to board a boat tour that's been inspired by the Shannon's Viking past. It's absolutely a beautiful morning, a little bit on the chilly side, but it's, uh, the sun is shining and we're heading south now into the town of Athlone. Michael MacDonald, known locally as, you guessed it, Viking Mike, has transformed his 21-metre wooden boat into a replica of a Viking Gnar. I always loved history in school, and most books you'll pick up on Viking history will mention Hare Island on the lake, where there was a substantial hoard of Viking treasure found there, uh, the last one being in 1802, regarded as the biggest uh, hoard of Viking gold armorings ever found in Europe. The Vikings sailed up the Shannon in the 830s and terrorized the settlements of Central Ireland. Up to 1,500 Vikings would attack the monasteries along the river and plunder them for valuable artifacts. Today, we're not going to ransack the local monastery. Instead, we're picking up a tour group in Athlone, the largest town in the Irish Midlands. I'm now 21 years operating the boat and it's turned out to be the, the biggest tourist attraction in the town. Athlone grew into a principal trading post because of its popular route for crossing the Shannon. Today, we have to pass through the Athlone Lock, one of the largest locks on the river. The town's lock, weir and road bridge were all constructed by Shannon Navigation Commissioners in the 1840s. So now the lock keeper has closed the gates behind us, and when we get to the same level as the far side, uh, the, lock, the lock keeper then will open the gates in front. Right, Brian, open it now. Yes, it is. What's the next stop? America, is it? quite tranquil, it's very quiet, and I think also the meandering of the rivers as well is fabulous because the boat slowly kind of curves in between them, and I think that's part of the, the joy of it. They call it the Majestic Shannon. I suppose it's my passion, you know, and I'm still fascinated with 
the different things that you can see what's on the shoreline every day as we go by. And the shoreline is never the same. There's always something different to see there. Mike's tour ends here at the impressive monastic settlement of Clonmacnoise. Established in 547 AD, it grew into an important center of religion and learning because of its riverside location. It also came under attack from Vikings, not least in the year 845 AD, when a scribe notes in a medieval manuscript that Vikings rampaged throughout the central Midlands and plundered and burned Clonmacnoise. In the 1960s, visitors of the less bloodthirsty kind started to flock to the waters of the Shannon. As goods barges made way for pleasure cruisers, tourism was embraced by the many small businesses along the river. Not least where we're headed to next, JJ Hock's pub of Banaher, where they've been serving drinks for some 380 years. Jair Hock, the current owner of this establishment, likes to continue a thriving musical tradition started by his forebears. My grandfather bought this pub in the 1940s. Pubs were a very conservative place back then. I mean, back then there was no music, no cursing, no bad language, all very conservative. But then my granddad, his kids, they were all taught music, so he brought a piano down from upstairs in the parlor and they started to sing away. The reason for Banneher's existence is the River Shannon. Then tourism started on the River Shannon around the early 60s, and my granddad would stand outside with a whiskey and he'd look down the town and when he'd see tourists, he'd get them all, quick start playing and uh, start drawing in uh, tourists. There's a great tradition of great Irish musicians around here. They just love the music here and love the crack. And you know, it's, it's that connectivity. It's the open mic style of entertainment that anyone can join in. I mean, there's guys from all over the world that have joined in in the music sessions here over the years. So it's, you know, everyone is welcome. Cheered by traditional music, or maybe just the refreshments, we continue down the Shannon towards the sea. 20 kilometers south of Banaher, the river now opens up into its third major lake, Loch Derg. Covering an area of 80 square kilometers, Loch Derg is the third and largest lake the Shannon flows into. An exquisite beauty spot peppered with small islands, 376 of them to be exact. One man who's devoted his life to exploring these islands is Gerard Madden, a passionate local historian and fisherman. I've been coming here 30 years and I still find it fascinating. There's always something new to find out here. Today, we're hitching a ride with him over to the western side of the lake to one of Ireland's most famous monastic sites, Inish Kaltra, or Holy Island. That's my favorite view by a mile. Look at that, that's beautiful. With the raven's nest on the tower. This 25-meter round tower is a remnant of the Shannon's Viking past. Built by monks, these towers had a door on the first floor accessible only by ladders. 
When Viking raiders were sighted, the monks would grab food and monastic treasures and retreat up the tower, pulling up ladders as they climbed. Gerard is the go-to guide to Holy Island and has an unrivaled knowledge of the ancient artifacts preserved by the monks who once lived here. The Shannon was the dual carriageway, the only decent roadway in Ireland. Everybody travelled by water. It was very unsafe to travel by, by land, as all the chieftains and along the way they were all warring with, with one another. So the monks knew this, so they built these monasteries along the Shannon, and the temptation to pull in here, I'd say, was huge. These sheep are not supposed to be in here. They have enough grass outside. <laughs> but the, it's hard to keep them out. Shoot, 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 shoot. There are the ruins of seven churches on Holy Island. This one, St. Cayman's Church, is the oldest. Built some 1,000 years ago, it was roofed in the 1990s to protect some of the island's most important artefacts. Now here in St. Cayman's Church, we have grave markers from the 8th century to the 12th century. We have a stone here, which is a swear stone. That those, those markings are sword marks, two chieftains making peace, and they'd marked their, that's really their signature. Its secluded position has enabled it to survive like in such a perfect state of preservation. And there are very, very few places left in the world as, as pristine as this. This is known as a bargaining stone. People come here and they, they shake hands through the stone and they make a deal. And war we tell anyone that breaks the deal that's made at that stone. Lots of people come nowadays and get actually married at the stone. The Vikings came here on three occasions, they stole everything and took off. But of course they were raided as many times by the Irish themselves as by the Vikings. These monasteries were a centre of wealth and music and where they had scriptorums. They were really the only bit of places where there was a civilization in this, in this country. Leaving this ancient place of sanctuary to its woolly guardians, we're heading across Loch Derg. On the bank of the lake, there's a sheltered mooring that's hiding the prized possessions of one boat-mad group of locals. Welcome to my family's weird obsession. Aoife Burke and her relatives have been renovating heritage barges for the last 30 years, and they've built up an astonishing collection. So we've got my dad's, my uncle's, mine, my brother's, and two spares, which is always necessary. Ignore this lovely new shiny one, and I'll show you my old rusty one. At just 21, Aoife bought her 1926 motor barge at auction. It had been left to decay for decades, so transforming this empty rust bucket into a living space has been a labor of love. The long-term aim is to just have it as a holiday house that I can use every summer. The boat will be 100 in a couple years' time. That kind of gives me the push to get it finished. And I'd really love to have it done for then and have a big celebration. It's the people on the waterways that have really shaped me and helped me grow into the person that I am. And it's the love of this that bonds me with some of my best friends because we have that much passion for it that it's just a part of our blood, it's part of who we are. Once a common sight up and down the Shannon, motor barges were the perfect vessels for delivering goods all over the country. Used by Guinness for delivering barrels of the black stuff, it's said that when the bargemen arrived in town, the locals would follow them to the pub, as they'd be sure to know who had the best pint in the area. Here we go. Aoife's barge isn't just a museum piece. This boat is fitted with a Scottish-designed Kelvin 75-horsepower engine. Today, we're joining her and Mum Geraldine to head to the south of Loch Derg. 
But at 18 meters long and four meters wide, these are not easy boats to drive. It's lovely. Like, you miss it when you're away. You really miss being out. And, like, just the open space. I don't have my ballast fully done because I haven't done the front of my boat, so my boat does tend to rock quite a lot. I'll just let him off there for a minute. We have a life ring. We're grand. Even in the, like, absolute, you could say, misery out here, it's kind of exhilarating. At the centre of the lake, the wind picks up. The ever-changing weather here can often test Aoife's boating skills. Whoa! No, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Yeah. OK, worst moment in seven years, but I'm still here. We're going to walk a bit for a minute now, and then we'll stabilize. We're out of the worst of it there. My flag is the most important piece of equipment on my boat for my engine. Um, when we were starting to rock there, you put your nose to the wind, especially on a flat bottom boat. But from my flag, I know where my nose needs to be to stabilize my boat. It does take kind of years of knowing the particulars of your own boat. Leaving the Burks to their beloved barges, we're continuing our journey down the Shannon towards the sea. We've reached the town of Killaloo. Here, the Shannon widens as it meanders through the foothills of County Clare. Today, kayaking expert Killian O'Mara is giving local historian Arlene White a new perspective on a town she knows so well. It's amazing to see even some of the historical features you just don't see when you're walking around. So yeah, it's a fantastic way to see things. Killaloo is famous for being the ruling seat of the legendary medieval king, Brian Boru. Celebrated for ending the Viking dominance of the Shannon, he united the country. And here, in this wooded outcrop, was his fort. Behind us here, we have Brian Boru's fort, or Bail Boru in Irish. And this was the homestead of Brian Boru, who we say is Ireland's greatest high king. He was born here in the hills behind the fort. And when he became high king in 1002, he actually broke with tradition and decided to rule the country from his homestead in Killaloo. Um, so Killaloo was the capital of Ireland from 1002 to 1014. From here, he could basically rule the river. The threat of Viking attack was always present, really. Limerick was a huge Viking city. Um, so from here, as you can imagine, there any sign of, of Viking boats or, or attacks coming up through the river, he could plan ahead and stop it from happening. From 1002 until his death by Viking sword at the Battle of Clontarf in 1014, Brian Boru reigned from Killaloo. Although it was Ireland's capital for just a short time, his base here on the Shannon enabled Baru to become one of the most successful and unifying monarchs in medieval Ireland. We continue our journey. 18 kilometers downriver from Killaloo is an extraordinary feat of engineering which would change the Shannon and Ireland forever the Ardner Crusher Power Station. A hundred years ago, the newly independent Irish state had a rural economy and only 1% of its population had access to electricity. In order to modernize the country, the government decided to build a record-breaking hydroelectric power station here at Ardner Crusher. Professor Joachim Fischer is a specialist in its extraordinary history. Just behind us, we see Ardner Crusher Power Station, and uh, this is really the core piece of the Shannon Scheme. The Shannon Scheme was uh, built between 1925 and 1929, 
And it was a, a hugely important project at the time. Uh, it was the beginning of the electrification of Ireland. The channel is diverted and uh, brings the, uh, the water down to the power station here and drops about uh, 30 meters there and drives four turbines which generate the electricity. At the height of the Shannon scheme, about 5,000 people were working on this project. It cost about 20% of the budget of the state in 1925. So it, it was a huge economic project, uh, uh, an economic gamble. Despite delays and rising costs, this project was a great success. By 1929, the new power station was capable of providing electricity to all of Ireland. But at first, people were nervous of this new fangled wizardry. So the government had a new challenge, to persuade people to use the energy they were generating. It was very difficult for people to imagine that electricity was actually needed in the country. In order to increase consumption, the Electricity Supply Board ran uh, advertising campaigns, uh, especially directed at women, to engage women in the purchase of electric cookers, for example. You know, it's as good as a new pair of glasses to have a light like that in the house. The electric pump brings running water to the most isolated dwellings, making it possible for the country folk to enjoy the benefits of modern sanitation. For this relief, much thanks. Today, we're hopping aboard the boat of the man tasked with looking after the river around Ardna Crusher, Pat Lysat. The river, to me, is my life. You know what I mean? Great to pass away the time on. Great for the mines. Let your troubles flow away with the water. <laughs> I wouldn't leave any place else. Pat's work maintaining the waterways means he's rarely found out of his robust five-metre pioneer boat. Any excuse does me to come on the river. I go to town by boat, <laughs> mostly to avoid the traffic. Today, Pat's taking us through the giant power station lock. We're approaching the, the lock now. Not only was the power station the largest infrastructure project the country had ever seen, the crusher. its construction also required the creation of the deepest lock in Ireland. Descending 30 metres in two chambers, it takes one full hour to pass through here by boat, which gives Pat time to reflect on the realities of life for the people who worked on this immense project. It gave great employment at the time. The wages were very, very small. I think it was 32 shillings a week. And of course, the Irish paddies they lived under very tough conditions here. They lived in cow sheds, pigsties, you know, anything for to live near the site. Finally, the vast electronic gates let us through to meet the waters rushing out from the turbines towards the sea. We've traveled 260 kilometers from the source of the River Shannon on our journey towards the sea. After the Ardna Crusher power station, the mighty river becomes a wide tidal estuary, sweeping through the land for 113 kilometers until it reaches the Atlantic. Lined with mud flats, the shelter of the estuary provides a unique breeding ground for marine life and is home to a great array of seabirds and wildlife. But it's not just migrating birds that pass through here. The Shannon Estuary is one of the most important shipping lanes in the country, with ferries, fishing boats, 
and commercial ships vying for space. Sat on the estuary amongst the industrial port buildings is the town of Foynes, an unlikely spot to have a glamorous history. Foynes is classed as a new town by Irish standards. And we had one street village, uh, but it's in a strategic position because of the river. Because of its location in a sheltered but deep stretch of the estuary, Foynes was the ideal spot for landing flying boats. These aircraft, with a large hull that allowed them to land on water, are the passion of Margaret O'Shaughnessy. Flights had just started into Fines in 1939 when the Second World War broke out and that changed everything because Ireland became a neutral country. So if you wanted to get to Europe from the United States or Canada, you had to come into Fines. We were the kind of transit point. Ireland and Canada were the two countries that facilitated all transatlantic flights in the 1930s and 40s. These extraordinary aircraft brought in the top A-listers. Bob Hope was here, John F. Kennedy, the late president, was here, Yehudi Menwin, the violinist, was here, Gracie Fields, everyone and anyone you can think of at that time transited fines over the 10-year period that we were a flying boat airport. I would love to have been here at that time, because to me it was, uh, what let's say, like another Casablanca. You're just about to go on board the world's only full-scale replica of a Boeing 314 flying boat, the Yankee Clipper. As you can see, the cockpit is huge. It was the biggest cockpit of any aircraft at that time. But they needed it because you had the navigators here, you had the radio officer, and you had the engineer. If there was an issue with an engine during the flight, They'd open this hatch, this would open, and they could climb out to the engine inside in the wing to check out what was wrong. And behind us here is the cockpit where you had your two pilots, pilot, co-pilot. A ticket to fly from New York to Fines in the late 30s, early 40s was $337 one way. 675 return. That was a huge amount of money in those days. But you could, had you the necessary finance, book the honeymoon suite, which was a special ticket, and you got this beautiful honeymoon suite at the back with its own private bathroom. All the food prepared on board, and it was food that you could possibly get in a five-star hotel. This was your daytime layout for traveling. You see, the journeys they could take anything from 12 to 17 hours. It all depended on the weather conditions, how long the flight would take. So you actually went to bed and you left your shoes out for the uh, staff to polish them, shine them, lay them back for the morning for you. It was the height of luxury. Shoes freshly polished, we're heading west from Foynes. The final part of our journey takes us past the fishing boats heading out of harbor to the exact spot where the Shannon flows into the sea. The stunning Loophead Peninsula marks the point where the Shannon finally meets the ocean. Here, atop dark cliffs that give way to the wild Atlantic is an extraordinary landscape of rocky outcrops. Martin Hock grew up here on the peninsula and knows all there is to know about this distinctive landscape of exposed rock caused by the pressures of converging continental plates some 300 million years ago. Why I like coming here, it's, it's so remote and it's as, a, as remote a spot as you're going to get in Ireland. We're at the tip of Loop Head and on your left hand side you have the wild Atlantic. They don't call the Wild Atlantic for nothing. And on the right-hand side, you have the mouth of the Shannon. So you come down the Shannon, a lot calmer, breaching into the Atlantic Ocean. So you have the Atlantic Ocean meets the Shannon River. The Loophead Lighthouse that guides ships into the sheltered waters of the Shannon is just one of the features that links this spot with the rest of the world. But the next touch is Boston. <laughs> the last pub to New York or Boston was Keaton's pub down here in the village. 
the era sign, which was put in during the Second World War. It was like a grid reference up and down the coast, and this area was era 45. So anybody that was flying over knew exactly where, where they were. The last view of home for many Irish people and a welcome sight for others, this epic headland is a fitting end to our journey. We've followed the majestic River Shannon all the way from the mountains of Central Ireland to the spectacular cliffs of the Atlantic shoreline to discover how this important river was navigated by ancient civilizations and how it continues to connect people who live and work along the river today. Our voyage down Ireland's longest river alongside the locals who call the Shannon home has been a truly magnificent river journey.